During the Second World War, India, as a part of the Allied nations, sent over two and a half million soldiers to fight under British command against the Axis powers, the largest all-volunteer force in history. Meanwhile, Subhas Chandra Bose, one of the most prominent leaders of the Indian independence movement, sought alliance with Nazi Germany as a tool for subverting the British Empire. The Indian National Congress denounced Nazi Germany but would not fight it or anyone else until India was independent. The British rule in India, known as the British Raj, is a subject of significant controversy and debate. On December 31, 1600, Queen Elizabeth of England granted a royal charter to the British East India Company, authorizing it to conduct trade with the East. The company's ships first arrived in India in 1608, docking at Surat. Four years later, British traders engaged in a conflict with the Portuguese at the Battle of Swali, ultimately securing the favor of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. In 1615, King James dispatched Sir Thomas Rowe as his ambassador to Jahangir's court, resulting in a commercial treaty that allowed the company to establish trading posts in India in exchange for European goods. By the mid-1600s, the company had established trading posts, or factories, in major Indian cities. In 1670, King Charles granted the company further rights, including the ability to acquire territory, raise an army, mint its own money, and exercise legal jurisdiction in areas under its control. By the end of the 17th century, the company had effectively become a sovereign entity on the Indian subcontinent, wielding considerable military power and governing the three presidencies. The British solidified their territorial presence in India when company-funded soldiers defeated the Nawab of Bengal. Following this victory, Bengal became a British protectorate under the East India Company's direct rule. Bengali farmers and craftsmen were compelled to work for minimal compensation, while their tax burden increased significantly. Despite rising trade and revenue from other sources, the company faced substantial military expenditures, threatening its stability. To address these challenges, the British Parliament enacted Lord North's India Bill, which granted supervisory control over the East India Company to Whitehall, the British government administration, without assuming direct power. This marked the beginning of governmental oversight in India. Over the next 50 years, the British focused on eliminating Indian rivals. At the turn of the 19th century, Governor-General Lord Wellesley embarked on significant territorial expansion, defeating Tipu Sultan, annexing Mysore, and eliminating French influence from the subcontinent. In the mid-19th century, Governor-General Lord Dalhousie pursued further expansion, defeating the Sikhs in the Anglo-Sikh Wars, annexing the Punjab, and subduing Burma in the Second Burmese War. He also employed the doctrine of lapse to annex princely states without male heirs. The annexation of Oud in 1856 marked the company's final territorial acquisition as the following year saw the eruption of widespread Indian grievances into a major rebellion against the so-called Company Raj. On May 10th, 1857, sepoys, Indian soldiers of the British Indian Army rose against their British officers in Meerut, a cantonment 65 kilometers northeast of Delhi. The rebellious soldiers marched to Delhi to pledge their allegiance to the Mughal Emperor, sparking a widespread uprising across north and central India. This insurrection, known as the Indian Rebellion of 1857, saw many Indian regiments and kingdoms join the fight against the British while others remained loyal to the company. The causes of the rebellion were varied and deep-rooted, encompassing political, economic, military, religious, and social grievances. Governor-General Lord Dalhousie's policy of annexation, particularly through his 
doctrine of lapse alienated many Indian rulers. The justice system was perceived as inherently biased against Indians. Official documents presented to the House of Commons revealed that company officers faced minimal repercussions for crimes against Indians. Economically, the company's policies were deeply resented. Precious Indian resources like gold, jewels, silver and silk were exported to Britain, depleting India's wealth. The land reorganization under the Zamindari system harshly affected farmers, who were often forced to grow commercial crops instead of subsistence crops, leading to economic hardship and increased food prices. Local industries, notably Bengal's famed weaving sector, suffered under British rule. Low import tariffs flooded the Indian market with cheap British goods, decimating indigenous industries. India, once a major producer of luxury textiles, was reduced to supplying raw cotton to Britain, which then sent back manufactured goods for sale in India. The immediate trigger for the rebellion was the introduction of new cartridges for the Enfield rifle, rumored to be greased with pig and cow fat. This offended both Hindu and Muslim sepoys who refused to use the cartridges and eventually mutinied. The rebellion quickly spread, engulfing much of northern India, including Oud and other recently annexed territories. The British, initially unprepared and terrified, struggled to quell the uprising. Despite early setbacks, British forces, bolstered by reinforcements, managed to suppress the rebellion and reassert control. The rebellion marked a turning point in Indian history. In May 1858, the British exiled the Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar to Rangoon, Burma, after executing most of his family, effectively ending the Mughal Empire. In the aftermath, cultural and religious centers were closed and properties of those involved in the uprising were confiscated. The British dissolved the East India Company and imposed direct rule under the British Crown. Queen Victoria, proclaimed Empress of India in 1877, promised equal treatment under British law. Many existing economic and revenue policies remained largely unchanged, but several significant administrative changes were implemented. A key development was the establishment of the Secretary of State for India in London, a cabinet post responsible for overseeing Indian affairs. In India, the Governor-General, referred to as Viceroy when dealing with the princely states, managed the administration from Calcutta, supported by executive and legislative councils. For many years, the Indian civil service and other elite professions, such as law and medicine, were dominated by British-born individuals. This began to change in the 1880s as a growing number of native-born Indians, educated in British schools either in India or Britain, started to enter these professions. In 1858, the Viceroy announced that the government would honour existing treaties with the princely states and renounced the doctrine of lapse. Approximately 40% of Indian territory and 25% of the population remained under the control of 562 princely states, which were notable for their religious and ethnic diversity. British attitudes toward Indians shifted from relative openness to insularity and racism, even against those Indians who shared similar backgrounds and achievements. British families and their servants lived in segregated cantonments, distant from Indian communities. Exclusive private clubs for social interaction among the British became enduring symbols of elitism and snobbery. During the period following the 1857 rebellion, some aspects of modernization brought about by the Industrial Revolution did benefit India. Foreign investors established jute mills around Calcutta, and Indian merchants set up cotton textile factories in Gujarat and Bombay. However, this progress came at the cost of traditional industries. Post-1857 India also endured a series of devastating famines, some of the worst in recorded history. Around 25 major famines swept through states in the latter half of the 19th century, resulting in the deaths 
of 40 million Indians. The British response to famines often fell short. Subsequent British administrations conducted serious investigations into famines and established the Famine Insurance Grant and a General Famine Commission, which led to the adoption of a famine code. The 21st century Indian legal system, governmental structure, national capital and railway network remain heavily influenced by the British period. The late 19th century marked the beginning of steps towards self-government in British India. The British appointed Indian councillors to advise the Viceroy and established provincial councils with Indian members. The Morley Minto reforms were a significant milestone, gradually introducing the elective principle for membership in Indian legislative councils. For Muslims, it was crucial to gain a place in all India politics while retaining their Muslim identity. Before and during the World War I, militant movements gained momentum, with efforts by Germans and expatriate Indian groups aiming to destabilize British India. By the war's end, militancy had waned, but India's substantial contributions to the British Empire's war efforts led to heightened expectations and demands for political progress. Subsequently, tariff protection was finally provided to Indian industry. Despite these reforms, political demands in India were not satisfied. The British responded with repression, reinstating restrictions on the press and movement. An unintended violation of rules against public gatherings led to the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar in April 1919, galvanizing political leaders to push for further action. Muslim leaders joined Gandhi in mobilizing the masses for the 1920 and 1921 civil disobedience and non-cooperation demonstrations in response to the Amritsar massacre. Gandhi endorsed the Khilafat movement, thus garnering Hindu support for a previously Muslim cause. By 1942, Indians were deeply divided over World War II, as the British had unilaterally entered India into the war without consultation. The British Indian Army grew to two and a half million by the end of the war, becoming the largest all-volunteer army in history. However, in July 1942, the Indian National Congress passed a resolution demanding complete independence from Britain, proposing massive civil disobedience if their demands were not met. In August 1942, the Quit India Resolution was passed at the Bombay session of the All India Congress Committee, marking the start of the Quit India movement. This movement featured massive, initially peaceful demonstrations and denial of authority, undermining the British war effort. Large-scale protests and strikes occurred nationwide, with widespread sabotage, including bomb attacks on Allied supply convoys, government buildings set on fire, and transport and communication lines severed. The movement soon became a leaderless act of defiance, with many deviating from Gandhi's principle of non-violence as local underground organizations took over. Meanwhile, during the bloodiest years of the war in Europe and Asia, Indian revolutionary Subhash Chandra Bose escaped from house arrest in Calcutta and ultimately reached Germany and then Japanese-occupied South Asia. He sought Axis help to raise an army to fight against British rule in India. Bose formed the Azad Hind government as the provisional free Indian government in exile and organized the Indian National Army with Indian POWs and expatriates in Southeast Asia with Japanese assistance. These revolts, coupled with the weakened post-war Raj and the loss of faith in the British Indian armed forces, ultimately influenced the decision to end the Raj. By early 1946, all political prisoners had been released. The British openly adopted a political dialogue with the Indian National Congress for the eventual independence of India. On the 15th of August 1947, the transfer of power took place. At midnight, on the 14th of August 1947, Pakistan, including modern Bangladesh, was granted independence, followed by India's independence the next day.